So I just came across this forum topic yesterday, and I thought it would be an interesting video. Now, most of my videos are usually about machine learning or data science, but in the real world, if you want a job, you're going to have to pass the interview. Interestingly, many of these interviews follow the standard format of generic coding interviews. So not only do you need to know machine learning and data science, but you also need to have a good handle on writing algorithms. Later in this video, we are going to walk through an example coding interview question. But before we do that, I realize that this is probably a lot more believable when you can hear it from other people rather than me. If you hear it from me, you might think I have some ulterior motive like selling a course. Luckily, a discussion involving other people is exactly what we have today. So here's the question that got posted. This stuff is completely over my head. They always ask this for data science and ML positions, and while I feel like I know the principles of ML slash stats, I get shafted by this section. I have never taken a CS class. Most of my programming is done in R slash Julia and focuses on numerical computing. They almost never ask me to implement a GLM via gradient descent or IRLS, which I would be very comfortable doing. It's always some data structure or general algo related question, never statistical slash ML algorithms. Why are these questions asked instead of asking you to analyze a data set or something? What value do lead code style questions have in this field? I have never seen these things come up in actual stats slash ML work, yet so many DS slash ML coding challenges include them. The coding parts never ask me to demonstrate my actual knowledge of ML in code. I find these questions a lot harder than a real ML. My mind doesn't work this way, and I didn't go into CS for this reason. It's like they want to gatekeep stats slash math slash sciences people from getting into ML. Before we get started, just a very brief reminder that currently, two of my VIP courses are currently on sale using special VIP coupons. My latest course, Financial Engineering and Artificial Intelligence in Python, will teach you important concepts such as how to model stock returns, time series analysis, portfolio optimization, the capital asset pricing model, algorithmic trading, and Q learning. My latest deep learning course on PyTorch covers everything from the ground up, from basic linear models to ANNs, CNNs, and RNNs, along with NLP, computer vision, transfer learning, GANs, recommender systems, facial recognition, and deep reinforcement learning. Remember that the VIP versions of these courses contain exclusive content that you will not get if you do not get the VIP version of the course. The current VIP coupons expire in less than one month, so get your copy today. By clicking on the links in the description below, the VIP coupons will be automatically applied so you don't have to enter the coupon code yourself. Okay, now here are some responses. The reality is that ML jobs worth a damn will involve integrating well-known industry standard models within your company's greater software infrastructure. This requires some amount of software engineering knowledge. Not an insane amount, but enough to be competent. You're absolutely right. I'm currently working at a large financial firm where we are trying to build a service upon a library written by data scientists. OP should not underestimate the value of being able to write good code, otherwise their work might never see the light of day. Not to mention the amount of software skills you need to be in industry. Writing code for more than one system is really hard, but it is inevitable at scale. Exactly, software skills are a must. Almost all the time I have both hats on, data scientist and software engineer. One cannot survive without the other. Unless you are doing pure research, which is very rare, you will probably be writing code inside the company's code base with its software engineering conventions, version control system, bug tracking, etc. So understanding general programming is definitely helpful. The reality of it is that most jobs out there in the industry want practical software skills. Moreover, the people leading the industry are CS people, so they get to dictate what's important. Those CS questions are going to be asked in interviews, even if you have a PhD and are applying for pure research positions in the industry. The truth is that ML is a fundamentally applied research area. There is no position in the industry for an ML engineer that can't code an efficient algorithm. Those lead code type questions are trying to measure how well you are keeping core CS concepts in your daily programming habits. 
There are exceedingly few ML slash DS positions that don't require you to be a competent programmer. You seem to be imagining a kind of designated hitter ML position where you don't do anything but analyze data. That's just not the way things work. I worked at a FANG where we hired a data scientist who just knew math. He took months to implement things that we could import with one line of code. We tried to transition him to research scientist so he could just research and not have to code, but unfortunately he was incapable of making groundbreaking research. To add on to the already huge wave of people, regardless of your engineering field, knowing how to program is absolutely essential today. It doesn't matter if you're mechanical, machine learning, or anything. And it's very quickly becoming an essential skill for any job. Okay, so I hope you're convinced that software engineering skills are pretty important. Now that we can all agree that this is true, let's look at an example of a question you might get during a coding interview. Okay, so our interview question is this. Suppose that we are given two lists, which are sorted. What we would like to do is merge them into one single sorted list. How would you do this? Now, before we move on to the rest of this video, I want to give you an opportunity to pause this video and think of the solution by yourself. So please pause the video now and write down your solution. Okay, so hopefully you thought of a solution to this question. First, I want to talk about an answer, which you may have come up with if you tend not to think algorithmically, but more in terms of using APIs. And yes, just to be clear, this is not the correct answer. Although, during the interview process, we care about your thought process as well. So even if you can't think of the right answer, you might still get some points for explaining why this is not the optimal answer. Okay, so as you can see, this answer is pretty simple. All we do is concatenate the two lists and then sort the resulting list. Now, before we talk about why that's the wrong answer, let's look at the right answer. The intuition for the right answer is this. Basically, we are going to maintain two pointers, one for list A and one for list B. We are going to walk through each of the two lists element by element, taking the smallest element each time. At each step, we're going to push the smallest element onto our resulting list. So our result list will grow step by step and each element added to it will be the smallest available element at the time. Let's do an example to ensure that this works. We can see that A contains the elements one, three, and six, and B contains the elements two, four, and five. At the first step, both pointers are pointing to the first position at A and the first position at B. Since the value at A is smaller, we add that to our result list and increment the pointer. Now our A pointer points to three, but our B pointer points to two. Therefore, the next step is to add two to our result list and increment the B pointer. Now our A pointer still points to three, but our B pointer points to four. Therefore, we add three to our result list and the A pointer moves up to six. Next, since four is less than six, we add four to our result list and move the B pointer up to five. Since five is less than six, we add five to our result list and move the B pointer past the end of the list. Finally, since we are no longer able to do any comparisons, we simply add the rest of A to our result list, which is six. Now, the tricky part for most people is not the intuition, but rather, it's putting that intuition into code. Unfortunately, this is also the part that cannot be taught. The fact of the matter is, only practice can make you better. Just like how you can't learn to play tennis by watching tennis on TV, you can't learn to code by watching other people code. The only way to get better is to code yourself. That being said, you might want to pause this video before we look at the answer so that you can try to code up the solution on your own. Okay, so now we are going to walk through the answer. First, we start by grabbing the length of A and the length of B, since we need to use these values later in the function. We'll call these M and N. Next, we initialize the result list, which will have length M plus N. Now, you might ask why I'm doing it this way, instead of just making an empty list and appending to it. This is just to reflect how coding works in the C++ and Java world, which is more popular in software engineering compared to Python and other scripting languages. 
Basically, this is because dynamically allocating memory is generally slower. This is, for example, why we prefer to use list comprehensions instead of for loops and appending. The next step is to create our pointers, which are just indices into each of these arrays. We'll use i to index a, j to index b, and k to index the result. Next, we enter a loop that proceeds only if i is less than a and j is less than b. This loop implements the main algorithm we discussed previously. Inside the loop, we check whether the current value of a is less than the current value of b. If it is, then we add it to the result and we increment the a pointer, which is i. Otherwise, we add the current value of b to the result and we increment the b pointer, which is j. Finally, we increment the result pointer, which is k. This will be incremented on each iteration of the loop, since on each iteration of the loop, we add an element to the result. Note that this loop will exit when we reach the end of a, or we reach the end of b. Therefore, at the end of this loop, there are leftover elements either in a or b, but not both. Luckily, this can be handled with two more for loops, one that goes through a and one that goes through b. This should be pretty self-explanatory, so I won't bother to go in depth. Okay, so after this, we will have added the leftovers in either A or B, at which point we can return the result. As an exercise, you might want to try implementing this yourself to ensure that it works. Now, if your solution was the initial wrong solution I proposed, you may be wondering why the subsequent solution was better. The answer to this is that the time complexity of the wrong solution is worse. To see this, notice how in the correct solution, the number of steps to find the solution is proportional to the length of the inputs. Using big O notation, we say that it's big O of m plus n. For the wrong solution, you're required to sort a list of length m plus n, so in total, it's big O of m plus n times the log of m plus n. This is super linear, and therefore, it is considered a worse solution than the linear solution. If you're not convinced of this, then I would recommend plotting f of x equals x and f of x equals x log x to see which one grows faster. Okay, so I hope you enjoy this video on coding interviews and you found it educational. If you like this video, please consider liking, subscribing, and signing up for my newsletter at lazyprogrammer.me. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode.